Well, good morning, and good morning in daylight savings time. Uh, Mark, our good friend, got the black bean this year. He got to uh, kick off. So now you've got a week to adjust, and uh, I'm sure you're all adjusted. I salute all of you for coming. Uh, I know that uh, it's rather difficult, everything an hour earlier. Uh, we are in the book of Proverbs, and we are starting a new chapter as we're just flying across these pages together. Uh, we are in chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. I have five Proverbs for us this morning. And here is one that we don't even need to read. We have recited it and referenced it so many times in our weeks and months of study. A good name is more desirable than great riches, and to be esteemed is better than silver and gold. 22.1. Here's two. Rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. And three, the prudent sees evil and hides himself, but the simple, your translation may have naive. Uh, King James translates this, pass on. The New American Standard translates it, proceed. I think that's also... Uh, the English Standard, if that's your translation, and pay the penalty. Here is 22.4. The wage for humility, the fear of the Lord, is riches, honor, life. And finally, our fifth proverb for the morning, 22.5. Snares. Now, this is a, an extremely difficult top line to translate. It may seem rather simplistic in your translation. It, it's a nightmare. But here's the text. Snares, nets for bird traps are in the way of the perverse. The one who would preserve his life keeps far from them. And when you have um, really difficult line to translate, what you do is you get the understanding or the gist of what the proverb is saying, and then you can go back and kind of outward in put the translation together. Uh, let me give you, uh, before we talk about how I'm going to uh, teach these Proverbs, let me give you an, a text to set a tab for. It's uh, Psalm 128. Okay, uh, and here is the way I'm going to teach these five Proverbs this morning. A name that endures. 22.1, a name that endures. And 22.2, wisdom is seen when both parties serve one another. Wisdom is seen when both parties serve one another. Twenty-two, three. There is wisdom in staying away. There is wisdom in staying away. And four. True spiritual life conveys. True spiritual life conveys 
rewards for both here and for eternity. Rewards for both here and for eternity. True spiritual life conveys rewards both for here and for eternity. And finally, five, the narrow way is the wise way. The narrow way is the wise way. Now, before I begin, let me tell you, I texted Mark last week after his study, and I gave him a great compliment on the fact that he can start this class and get out on time. And I have been a miserable failure. So I am going to try to do that today. Get you out on time. 22.1. Here's a good name. It's a better than proverb. And what is better than wealth? Wealth is a good thing. Uh, you can serve the Lord if you have wealth in a very powerful and distinguished manner. But here is something far, far better for you. And that is a name. That is a reputation. It, favor with men opens the way. And God is the one that bestows that favor. We've emphasized that continually through the Proverbs. That God brings it down upon a third party and suddenly they open doors for you. That's the idea of favor. So it is good favor with men that is superior to material assets. And that's what the proverb is saying. A good name to be esteemed. Now that word esteemed is the word grace. So here's the idea. Grace is extended to you uh, by other people. How did that happen? It happened because they extended grace to me. Amazingly. It's the effect of walking in wisdom. Based upon the character and based upon the memory of those who are acquainted with an individual. So what, is, what are those characteristics? Well, I went back and thumbed through the book of Proverbs and tried to list probably not comprehensive to all, but tried to list the characteristics that wisdom exposes in the book of Proverbs. And here is what I came up with. Dependable, kind, generous, sensitive, diligent, honest, humble, all a part of what wisdom brings into a walk of wisdom. So here is our top line, more desirable. That's Proverbs 21.3. To do righteousness and justice is more desirable to the Lord than sacrifice. That's our word. It's the superiority of a reputation to mammon here. Spelled out specifically. Look at your proverb. Silver and gold. The elements that have stood as wealth throughout the ages. Genesis 24, 53. The servant of Abram. He took out and gave to Rebekah silver and gold, jewelry, rewards. Solomon, 
Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 8 declared that in his autobiography that he amassed silver and gold. So in space and time, cultures and countries, these two elements, silver and gold, have always held a monetary value. And yet, look what the proverb is saying again. Social respect, the name is representative of far more. Virtue, and really permanence in your name and in your reputation. Now, a question. Who really teaches that? The uh, Stanford School of Business? University of Texas School of Business? Harvard? Yale? Princeton? Who teaches that? The University of uh, Geneva opened June 5th, 1559. The keynote address was given by John Calvin. And after he spoke with great fanfare and eloquence, Theodore Beza got up and explained the curriculum to the students. Very interesting the way that school was structured. Think of a circle, and in the circle you have these circles that surround that circle. And those are the various and sundry disciplines. There's history and mathematics, and there's literature, etc. All the studies of an educated scholastic education back in the 1500s. But what was different about it is right in the center of the circle was theology. Now, what was the concept and the idea of doing that? Well, here it is. That you graduate from Geneva and you go out as whatever. Wherever the providence and sovereignty of God places you in Europe. And there, you take up your volition. And you are acquainted with the Scriptures. You are an educated person regarding the Word of God. And there you will stay, and there you will flourish, and there you will be a light to society. That was the idea. Look what our business schools teach today. Just making money and making it more efficiently. Calvin's thought was changing the thinking of people for the progress of the gospel and the education delivered was something far more valuable than silver and gold. You know, when I was doing these um, proverbs originally, I was sent an email and it was marking the 20th anniversary of the death of James Montgomery Boyce. It's very interesting how it was put together. Two, two and a half minutes long. Nothing written, nothing spoken, just the day that he went to be with the Lord. And the background was music that he helped compose, and then pictures of him around his church, in the office, teaching students, speaking to people, here, there. I finished that, and I, I was invigorated. I was, I was stimulated to go and follow him that way. A few years back, the elders invited Bill McRae, who was back in the 70s, when I first began attending the meetings at the chapel, Bill McRae was the teaching elder. And his message was on the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation and the removal of that church's lampstand. 
But what, what really caught my attention was his lengthy introduction by telling us all what he was currently doing. And what he was currently doing was he was an itinerant preacher. And he was out, he said, every weekend of the year with the exception of two. Two holidays. And I thought to myself, my goodness, uh, we get these stories all the time of these billionaires jet-setting around, doing this, doing that, going into space. Here's a man that is constantly serving people in locations, quietly getting the work done. That stimulated me. What a great name. Bill McRae, yes. So it is far more valuable than money. That's the name. And the name is the representative of power and virtue. And it endures. It goes on and on. So I wrote myself a note. Note to self in finishing this proverb. Never try to build permanence with your name here. Note to self. That was Absalom. That was Saul. They built monuments to themselves. What fools. Live in obscurity. That's what I wrote. Stay in the shadows. Push others ahead. And listen to the voice of the apostle that turned the world upside down. By doing what? Here it is. Philippians 2 and verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, regard others is more important than yourself. Here's the proverb. Live that way. Practice that skill for living. And you will build a great name and a great reputation among us all. And you'll mark people for life. I thought to myself, when considering that curriculum, when I was a young seminarian in my studies, the men that came and approached me, not men in the ministry, they were men in secular jobs. Dennis Monroe in insurance and Larry Hairston a systems engineer. Howard Pryor, a systems engineer. And a doctor. A surgeon. Who everyone knew, that knew him, he was a Christian first. Charles Howard. Names that endure Names that last because of the depth of influence that they give to people. That's the business you want to be in for the remainder of your days. Here is two. Rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. This is a proverb from the horizontal perspective. It would appear that rich and poor have many differences. And yet, look what wisdom is teaching us here. Its emphasis is upon the common ground that they both occupy. This was surprising to me. This word to meet in the top line, I came across a word study on to meet. 
And it went on and on and on and on. It's such a predominant and interesting word. And I said to myself, oh, I've got to, I've got to get into this. I've got to share this. And then the voice came back. You'll never get through Proverbs. Just give them one proverb. Okay, so here it is. One proverb using this word to me. And we've already covered it. 1712. It, you don't need to turn there. You remember it quite well. It's the unavoidable, face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball meet between the mother she-bear and the fool that's trying to take her cub. Now, that's the word. So it's the idea when the poor and the rich meet together, you have this combustion, unavoidable conflict, consequences, consternation. Here is the bomb that's about to go off. And where did that occur? Well, in the ancient world, it occurred at the city gate. That's where all the matters were settled, the disputes among people. And you can just imagine the sounds of that going on. People yelling at one another at the city gates and all due to economic <coughs> disparity. And I'm sure there was hostility. And uh, I got to thinking about it. When Nathan went in to David and gave him that story, you know, about the rich man that had all those sheep, and there was the poor man that had just one sheep. And you remember how David responded? He grew angry. That's the idea of this word to meet. And yet, to our surprise, look at line two. It expresses the theological similarity between both parties. So let's think about that for a moment. Both parties come from one God, one Lord. I can, I thought of this word maker. Uh, when I did my first translation of the Greek text as a young student trying to maybe read my way across the page, I can still vividly remember translating John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word. And then, verse 3, all things were made by, through Him, and nothing was made without it being made by Him. So there it is. That's the idea. He's the maker. Now that's really how you interpret the proverb. You see the word Lord? That's the tetragrammaton, four letters. That's the covenant name. You don't ever skip over that name until you stop and ponder the name and what the name means. And we try to do that all the time because I want to emphasize to you that that word is undefinable. It's from the verb to be. I, will, I am what I am. To be, to be. He's beyond understanding. And the name itself is beyond human comprehension. So, that's the maker. That's the maker. Now, daylight savings time, I was driving the other morning toward the sunrise, and suddenly I was just struck by this view out my window. The clouds were arranged just such, and the rays were coming up over the horizon. Now in Oklahoma, we have a lot of high winds. So you have lots of dust particles in the air. And uh, the rays of sunlight refracted across those dust particles 
and against the clouds make magnificent views. Now, you know I'm getting old when I start talking about sunrises and sunsets. And you'll get rid of me when I start talking about flowers. But uh, I, I couldn't believe this. I just pulled, pulled over in a parking lot and I just said, this is amazing. And just as soon as it happened, it was gone. Why? Because that object that made those magnificent colors is the very object that took them away. The sun came up. They vanished, disappeared. He is the maker. You see that? He's the maker of all things. All things. All men, all creation. And we are to put that under Him. That's wisdom. That's really thinking life through in our walk. And what does that mean? Well, here's one simple way it means. Equal rights for everybody. <clears throat> Equal rights for everyone. We don't discriminate. What do the elders give us at the Lord's table? Welcoming everyone that's a believer in Christ. We don't discriminate. We don't separate. The world does that. Oh my gosh. The world lives on division. Separation. Here. There. I was enthralled in Dan's exposition of the woman at the well. John chapter 4. And in his first lesson, he gave us a great deal of time and attention on the division between the Samaritans and the Jews. Ethnicity. Here the proverb talks about division over money. That's rich and that's poor. So what does the proverb teach us for living? Well, here it is. The rich man should remember that how he treats the poor, how he thinks of the weak, is how he thinks of the Lord, who is his maker, who gave him everything. And how should the poor man think? He should think with this purpose, that I am going to serve my Lord. First, in all my ways and all my activities, see my hands, see my feet, I am serving Him in everything that I do in all that I say. So that what you really have is that when you have the rich and poor come together and they're all serving one another, people go, wow. Wow. That's amazing. Look at that people. Look at that church. Look how they behave. And it is the unity that our Lord told us about in the upper room. That is the skill for living. Here's three. The prudent sees evil and hides himself, but the simple, naive, you may have here in your translation, keep going or proceed. The King James translates it, pass on, and that is a good literal translation. And thus, pay the penalty. This proverb and verse 4 have similar ideas. A fine, a penalty, that's the idea of the word wage in verse 4, expressed in human accountability. Our proverb is balanced with the prudent in the top line and in line two with the simple and the naive. The proverb opens with the prudent, the shrewd. And the term used for devising, uh, dividing that word is wise, skillful, adroit, 
skills for obtaining success, achievement. And we've referenced all the time we've seen that word through the Proverbs, Abigail, 1 Samuel 25, putting that very wise train of donkeys together to feed David's men and cool his temper. That's the word. Some translations use the word cunning. The NIV translates success, Proverbs 14, 8, as giving thought to one's ways. That's prudent. Thinking your way through something, the ethical, moral way that righteousness achieves what one desires. Evil here is moral evil, breaking God's commandments. And then look at this. This is surprising in the proverb. Hides the idea is to take oneself away or off the field of play. That's what the fighting men of Israel did when Goliath, the Philistine, would come out and taunt them. Nobody put a toe on that field. They were cowards. They were afraid. David wasn't afraid. He didn't see a giant. He saw a pygmy. And he saw it that way because he believed the Word of God. You hear athletes talking about running through walls. I would run through a wall for that man. Well, in actuality, if you believe what the Word of God says, you walk through walls or run through walls every day. He is the Lord of the Word. So, how does this proverb surprise us? Well, here it is. This word to hide is actually associated with wisdom and wisdom's behavior. And here's how it works, practically speaking. The wise man says, I understand there's going to be an Antifa riot tonight. I'm going to stay away from that. But what about the simple naive? Well, they pass on. You see, they pass on, and the lexicon translates pass on as ultimately to be punished. And that is our proverb in 21.11. The mocker is punished. So the punishment is some type of penalty imposed. Thus the proverb The shrewd protects himself by not participating, taking protective action, while the morally dull, the naive, fail to see potential danger and get themselves into trouble. My friends, if there isn't a clear proverb about what happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin, I don't know what is. Here is a young man who gets a rifle across state lines, goes into Kenosha, not deputized, no badge, but he's going to protect the city and private property. People could say, that's good, that's wise. The proverb says that's naive and foolish. What happened? Men got killed. He got arrested. He became a political prisoner. And thus, it became national news. We've all heard the term, haven't we? Wrong place, wrong time. Well, that's the proverb. And that's what it's teaching. Stay clear. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes providence strikes and these things are unavoidable. But If at all possible, stay clear of potential dangers. Here's four. The wage for humility, the fear of the Lord, riches, honor, life. The proverb describes the 
rewards of a wise life. This top line opens with the word wage. It's really the, mean, the meaning of consequences. Here's the way David uses this word. Psalm 19, verse 11. By keeping the law, David declares, there is great, and there's our word, reward. Consequences. The consequences of humility in the top line, humility is the renunciation of human sufficiency. Psalm 60, verse 11 which declares that the help of man is worthless. So, that's what the Puritans call leaning upon the arm of the flesh. And here, associated with the fear of the Lord, that's your personal relationship to the Lord Himself. Now, we spoke a few lessons back regarding Psalm 128. And I want to refresh your mind about that, that's why I ask you to set a tab. We talked about the structure because I wasn't taught structure when I was a young student of the Bible. And structure is how the Spirit of God arranges the material so that you're able to see beyond the words to what the actual structure is trying to teach you. I'm going to show you that. <coughs> Here it is. Psalm 128. I want you to think again of a window. Think of a picture in a museum. Here's the top of the frame. And here's the bottom of the frame. Verse 1 is the top of the frame. Look at it. You see? And then look at the bottom of the frame. That's verse 4. The blessing of the man who fears the Lord. So that's the frame. The top and the bottom. Now, look at the content. Because that's what I really wanted to show you. The content. Look how it's laid out. This is the picture. This is what's in the window. You, 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 your labor, your blessings, your wife, your house, your children, your table. You know Paul's words to Timothy? Godliness is great gain. Well, here it is. Blessings. A quality of existence. A relationship with God. That's the wage. That's the consequences that you're benefiting from in this life and with a crescendo, with a gong in the life to come. Not the life of the fool. Not the life of the fool. Sumner Redstone was the chairman of CBS and Viacom. He was often quoted in the Wall Street Journal a few years back. No more. He's gone. But this man of many appetites, foolish man, in this one article in the Wall Street Journal, he boasted about how he had arranged his estate his various and sundry trusts in such a way that he would be ruling from the grave. That was his words. Well, he may be ruling as far as voting shares, percentages of those shares in his various trusts, but let me tell you for certain not what I am telling you, what the Bible is telling us. He rules nothing. Nothing. That's the fool. And that's the memory and the life and the legacy. Quickly, before I'm out of time, snares. Very difficult wording, top line, snares. 
bird trap, net used by fowlers. The design for these traps is to deceive the unwary bird to capture. The net is a figure for the young boy, girl in the home of the temptations that they can get themselves involved with in worldliness. All the trappings of the world that would carry them away. The perverse here is the morally degenerate. His lifestyle, look how it's described, the way. By practice, well, it's full of snares, traps that would lead him away and destroy his life. Just read the newspapers. They're there every day. There's one. Oh, there's one. There's one. There's another. <laughs> Look at line two. It presents the wise, the skillful with the defense to preserve and to protect. This word was used of Jacob tending, keeping, protecting Laban's flock in Genesis 30, verse 31. This word distance, ah, it's an interesting word, used in Joshua chapter 9 of the Gibeonites and their deception of Joshua and the children of Israel. They said, oh, we've come from a great distance. That's the word. So what is the proverb saying? Stay with wise people. Build your relationships with them. The wise walk with wise. The counsel of fools suffers harm. Psalm 73. The wicked are put in slippery places. So avoid them. And avoid their lifestyle. Their way. It's a way of death. It's a way of destruction. And their pathetic lives, no matter what they've amassed, not knowing who will get it, heaping it up, said the psalmist, their lives are a mess. But you and I, we have great reward, both here and in the life to come. In the life to come, much greater, much more magnificent. But here and now, our defense, our preservation, our protection is wisdom. Walk in it. Live with it. Embrace it. And God will bless your days and give you great joy and the benefits from it. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study today. Thank you for the elders and the deacons that serve here and for these, your people, who come to hear your word, the voice of the great shepherd. Strengthen them, build them up, bless their families, give them great riches, both here and in the life to come, because they have followed your word. In Jesus' name, amen.